Well, welcome everyone and uh, welcome to the Humanities Institute at Stony Brook. I'm the director, Adrian Perez Melgosa. We're truly, truly delighted to have this opportunity to listen and converse with Kay Sohini, a PhD candidate in the Department of English. And Kay is both a gifted comic author and a sophisticated cultural theoretician. She's joining both of these trends in her research and in her dissertation project. So welcome Kay to our institute in its virtual form. And this event is part of the focus on comics that we are developing at the institute. We have two lectures this semester. Today's event, let me just introduce uh, Professor Lisa, Lisa Diedrich, who's going to introduce Kay Sohini. Uh, Lisa Diedrich is the chair of the Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies Department. She is also instrumental in organizing today's talk and she's currently researching at the intersection of comics and critical health studies. Uh, and I think she's really the person, uh, the best person to introduce today's talk, I think. So please join me in welcoming Professor Diedrich and uh, in thanking her for organizing a lot of the event today. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Adrian. Um, uh, it's a, an honor and a pleasure to introduce Kay Sohini to you today. Um, I'm co-advisor of her dissertation along with uh, Professor Jeffrey Santa Anna, who is going to be talking later in the month um, in the English department at Stony Brook University. So I want to shout out to Jeff, who's the co-advisor but couldn't be here today, unfortunately. Um, Kay's work is already garnering, and I'm, I'm guessing many people on this call know this, but Kay's work is already garnering much acclaim. This year, she was awarded a highly competitive ACLS Mellon Dissertation Completion Fellowship to support completion of a dissertation that is both a formally innovative work of scholarly communication and responsive to the interests and histories of people of color and other historically marginalized communities. Put simply, Kay is an exceptional scholar, and you're going to see it today, I think, um, who is both highly self-motivated and endlessly curious. She has a formidable, she has formidable creative talents, as well as an incredible resourcefulness and determination to challenge herself and explore new intellectual terrains and expressive modalities. So she's well on her way to completing what will be a truly groundbreaking dissertation, both in terms of its form and content. She utilizes the comics form to present an autoethnographic analysis of experiences and events of marginalization and resistance. And I think she's going to talk a little bit about this today, but she's following in the footsteps of Nick Susanis, uh, whose graphic dissertation Unflattening was published by Harvard University Press to wide acclaim and Ebony Flowers, who worked with comics artist Linda Berry at University of Wisconsin to create a graphic dissertation about the project Drawbridge, which explores the therapeutic and educational effects of bringing graduate students and children together to draw. That we can count on a single hand the number of graphic dissertations suggests the originality of Kay's project. And even with the trailblaze by Susanis and Flowers, I would argue that Kay is charting wholly new territory. Um, and we've talked about this, but I believe hers will be the first or maybe the second graphic dissertation outside of the field of education. She has already attracted the attention of people in the comics field, um, Susanis um, and Hilary Shute, the foremost critic in the field of comic studies, have both enthusiastically agreed to serve as external readers on our dissertation committee. And this is all by way of saying Kay's work is something really special and will have an immediate and powerful impact both within and beyond the academy. Drawing a dis dissertation is a painstaking process that requires time and focus. Nonetheless, she has made excellent progress and will, I think, most assuredly defend her dissertation in May 2022. And to say that there is a buzz about her work is an understatement. Uh, she's already got interest from um, the editor of the exciting new Graphic Mundi series at Penn State University Press. So I think we will see the dissertation published fairly quickly. Kay is an incredibly productive and adventurous scholar 
who has developed an original voice across multiple modes. Um, she's just published a version of a chapter from her dissertation entitled Pandemic Pre Precarities for an Anthology on Comics Responses to COVID-19. That's also with Graphic Mundi. Um, she's currently co-editing a special issue of the Comics Grid on comics in and of the moment. And there's lots of other uh, publications as well. Um, as another sign of the kind of range of her engagement, she has also written pieces for the Grad Hacker column in Inside Higher Ed on mental health in comics and on international student precarity in the contemporary US. As her creative scholarly work shows, she has an interest in diversifying the field of comics and graphic narratives. To contribute to the important work of diversification and inclusion, she founded and serves as web editor for the online blog and zine Comics from the Margins. So her talk today draws on material from her graphic dissertation and is entitled Drawing Unbelonging Climate, Spatiotemporality, and Comics. So please join me in welcoming Kay Sohini. Thank you, Professor, for that really, really generous introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, and also, um, thanks to Adrian for inviting me. Super glad to be here and in such wonderful company. Um, my name is Kay Sohini, and I'm a final year, hopefully, a PhD candidate in English, um, where I'm currently drawing my, as Professor Diedrich said, doctoral dissertation as a comic. Um, which engages the sociopolitical through the lens of the personal to draw attention to systemic and interconnected issues pertaining to race, gender, disability, and environmental inequality. Um, I'm just going to share my screen, share the slides. Let me um, see if I can. Um, can you see my screen? One with the... Okay, thank you. So, um, right. So I started drawing comics seriously um, only like three to four years back when I started my PhD program. And I used to be a drawer as a kid, but I had a teacher who was really more interested in teaching me how to draw like famous painters he liked and not like teaching me actually how to draw or create. So after a few years, that kind of like made me kind of good at emulating shapes, but not much else. And I quickly lost interest in it till I joined Stony Brook. Um, and then I started reading comics like when I was in my undergrad or my master's program and I encountered uh, Nick Susanis' Unflattening. And that was like the very concept of comics, using comics as a method of scholarly inquiry was really interesting to me. So I'd approached my um, master's, one of my advisors in my master's program, and um, it wasn't really, I mean, I wanted to do that, but it wasn't really received well at that point, unfortunately, but that very quickly changed when I encountered Professor Diedrich and Professor Sandana in Stony Brook, and they were, like, super appreci appreciative of um, this method. Um, so, um, Drawing comics, let alone like within an academics, like drawing comics, and but you know, like especially within an academic setting, didn't really occur to me as before on flattening. But um, when I started like drawing it, I figured exactly how generative it can be. And apart from being really excited about the prospect of you know, like being able to actually draw comics for my dissertation, um, the medium was really important for important to me for two like key reasons. The first is the more I thought about comics as literatures of resistance, I had to think about modes of production. Um, I thought about how comics ap appeal to social justice and how they accommodate narratives by and about people who have been historically pushed to the margins and how they help readers reconsider social biases and gender, racial, cultural others. And the more, the more I was compelled to think about um, accessibility. Um, so, I figured that if I write in this medium, I would be able to kind of like combine my socio-ethical obligations with my scholarly writing. Um, uh, yeah, so, and also like comics kind of like has this history of kind of autoethnography. I mean, although like it's really called auto autobiography, but it's, it's similar, I would say. So um, that kind of like really, um, sorry, I missed the, what's going on? I'm sorry, I have literally no idea what the... 
Let me go into, I'm just going to stop sharing for a moment because I think I messed it up somehow. I'm going to have to reopen that. Um, sorry about that. Oh no, do not do this to me. Okay, I was able to open it again. I'll share my screen. Um, so you're seeing it again, hopefully? Okay, sorry about that. Just give me a sec, just trying to fix my screen a little here. Um, yeah, so sorry about that. Um, so also like I was really invested in um, scholarship about comics that highlighted the medium. So um, there are comic scholars who do this brilliantly in textual format. They kind of like the textual writing, the textual theorization kind of like acquires this visual appeal that works really well. But there's also like a lot of scholarship in comics that kind of relegates the medium to like a disposable like vehicle for communication, which is great. I mean, there's, you know, like space for all kinds of scholarship. But I figured like I personally wanted to focus more on like what you could do with the medium instead. So I figured the best chance I had is if I um, drew comics about comics instead of writing about them. And, but it was really, to be honest, it was really not before I actually started drawing that I realized how generative the comics medium is for me. Like I kind of like try to explain in this visual here, I pause for a moment, but um, not to go into a lot of detail, but I kind of like come from a culture where you're not really supposed to talk about your feelings. And I had this kind of like really complex childhood. And when I started drawing this, a lot of like repressed memories came out and I was able to process this. Professor Diedrich here actually has a term for this kind of Im image textual inquiry in comics called graphic analysis, um, which she defines as a, a long and difficult therapeutic and creative process of doing and undoing the self in words and images. So that was definitely a very revelatory and generative process for me, this kind of like image textual exploration. And Outside of my obsession with comics and the self, I'm also really fascinated by the use of comics and scientific or journalistic communication. Um, as, seen as, uh, and see, as seen as Malaka Garib's work uh, on NPR, for example, if you look it up. Um, or, and this is a page from, um, I'm also really fascinated by graphic journalism. So this is a page from my, the the publication that Professor Derek mentioned a while back from COVID Chronicles. This is on pandemic precarities and um, Asian American minorities and how we are pitted against other racial minorities. And these are the data visualizations by Mona Chalabi that I was talking about, as well as the NPR comics that uh, Malaka Gorib does. So um, I would say like my interest in comics stretches beyond graphic medicine, but as MK Sarvik um, said in a recent interview that comics on topics, topics like racial justice and uh, comics on topics like racial justice and climate change are graphic medicine as these issues profoundly impact physical and mental health and well-being. So um, yeah, so, but uh, coming to climate, spatial temporality and comics, um, I recently drew a chapter called Breathless. A part of it was published in the NIB and the rest of it is actually a recitation chapter that I'm finishing right now. Uh, so this chapter focuses on how uh, environmental sustainability is a disability and racial justice issue. I harness the visual effect of comics to give a kind of like a tangible shape to both the spatial and temporal scale of climate change and especially how it affects marginalized communities. Um, I believe that at a time when environmental factors are increasingly responsible for various illnesses and there's an increase in climate disasters despite, and despite the evidence we have about how it affects marginalized communities, the current climate discourse definitely still lacks adequate commitment to racial and disability justice. So 
and consequently I also believe that the efficacy of this medium especially in the pathography genre that I just mentioned uh, combined with this ability to kind of like manipulate time on the page makes it especially um, conducive to visualizing narratives that right that lie at this critical intersection um, so in my chapter uh, so in my chapter um, breathless I have been trying to creatively combine data visualization in the with the narrative aspect of comics um, to just go back to the start I kind of I like start with this kind of um, personal anecdote of growing up in a small town outside Calcutta and being able to see stars every day, which isn't something that you get to do in New York. Like I keep track of it. Like you can almost never see stars, but, um, and how that kind of like quickly changed when I um, moved to Calcutta for college and pretty quickly got severe asthma, which 10 years later I still suffer from. And in 2019, I think it was late fall, so I was having like this kind of like constant asthma attacks. In the middle of it, I came across this uh, article by BBC, which had this ridiculous headline about how uh, people with asthma can reduce their carbon foot footprint and save the planet by switching to greener medications, which is not very widely available and you just can't switch like that. There's like processes involved, including insurance. But yeah, it was this kind of like ridiculous headline. And it reminded me of the straw band controversy as well, where um, kind of like the onus of climate change and eco being eco-friendly is placed on vulnerable groups instead of on um, corporations and fossil fuel companies who are alone responsible for, I think, 70% um, of global greenhouse emissions. So um, here in this page, I talk about how disabl uh, disability activists such as Alice, Alice Wong point out how um, plastic straws are actually uh, accessibility need for the disabled community because a lot of the alternatives like um, paper straws or metal straws are not safe. And uh, so I kind of also talk about how there seems to be the subconscious belief deeply embedded in our culture that we can somehow individual action way out of a problem that's of planetary proportion. And I also look at kind of like what these numbers like result in, like what's really the effect of using plastic straws or what's really the effect of using the inhalers we, the non-eco-friendly inhalers that we currently use. And I found that emissions from asthma inhalers in uh, UK where the research was, research was based made up only 0.14% of the nation's total carbon emissions. So that was nothing. And similarly, uh, plastic straws make up only about 0.02% of plastic waste in the entire ocean, like globally. So again, it's nothing, but yeah. Um, um, I also uh, use this kind of like creative data visualization in to show like increase in heat waves in the United States over the last 35 years and um, increase in droughts and increase in wildfires to make a case for uh, climate action beyond individual adjustment that cannot really offset global emissions sufficient, sufficiently. Um, just pausing a little so that you can look at the visuals before moving on to the next point. And um, um, using the visual interface of the medium, I also have been trying to show disparities um, disparities in New York's infrastructure. For example, like um, when the tropical storm Elsa hit past through the city, um, it flooded parts of the city, and it was really jarring how. Um, a lot of the subway stations, if you looked at Twitter during that time, you could actually see it. A lot of the Im photos emerging of, uh, of like some more subway stations were in the Heights, which are typically um, has a lower, has a lower, in, a lower socioeconomic, uh, like, the, sorry, it has a, lo it's, a, it's a lower income than the city white medium, and also it's predominantly black neighborhoods. And on the other hand, like subway stations in the Upper East Side, which is super posh, um, was just fine. So I also looked up the elevation levels of each of these if of, of each of these subway stations, and it seemed like the subway stations in uh, Upper East Side were actually considerably lower in elevation than the ones in Heights. Yet the places in Heights were flooded and not Upper East Side, which kind of like points to the disc discrepancy in infrastructure based on demographic. So that's kind of like what. Um, you know, like it kind of like points towards environmental racism. Um, I've also been uh, most recently. I've also been working on visualization pertaining to the water crisis on Lake Mead, 
which is the, I think the largest reservoir in the United States. And as of early this year, I think maybe August, I cannot remember the exact month, but as of 2021, the federal government has issued the first ever water crisis on Colorado River. And in this visualization, I explained that um, how Lake Mead was last considered full all the way back in 1983. So that was like 10 years before I was born. So it's not a new problem. And um, I also like show how the current deficit is as high as the Statue of Liberty without its base to like kind of like try and point out exactly how serious this is and then with the help of um following 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 this with the help of these isometric cubes i try to explain the effect of water shortage uh the effect of uh, the effect of the water shortage will have on people in arizona california and nevada who depend on it for electricity as well as water and the, also the farmers who depend on it for irrigating 5.5 million acres of land as well as the impact is ha impact it will have on wildlife in the area, including fish and birds. Um, this I was looking at the scientific paper earlier today that, today that mentioned that um, lower levels of water will definitely result in high temperatures of water, which will then displace native fish and replace them with um, invasive non-native fish, which is not good for the ecosystem. And uh, there's also really scary stuff about what we will do to birds in the area. And there will be generally be decline in population of some species. Um, yeah, so uh, apart from climate change related data visualizations, I'm also making, I also make a case for why comics are well suited to creating an engaging public discourse on these fresh and pressing issues. Um, I use this uh, I tracked down the data for, you know, like increase in market size of comics over the last 20 years. Um, and I juxtaposed them with um, cultural recognitions. So for over the last 20 years, comics have received Pulitzers, MacArthur's and um, Guggenheim's National Book Awards, all these things. Um, so the, 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 this, this graph kind of like shows like how popular comics have become. Like, I think over the last five years, it's over a billion dollars industry and more and more people are reading comics every day. It's been used in schools and industries. And so it's really kind of like super engaging medium to talk about difficult issues. That's what I kind of like try to make a case for. Um, I end the chapter with um, Rob Nixon's concept of slow violence. Um, uh, slow violence is a type of structural violence that occurs gradually and out of gradually and out of sight, uh, gradually and out of sight or violence of delayed destruction that is dispersed across time and space. And following this, Rob Nixon in his like uh, slow violence book, he also asked that how can we turn the long emergencies of slow violence into stories dramatic enough to rouse public sentiment and warrant, uh, warrant political intervention. So in this entire chapter, I essentially kind of like try to make a case for why I think comics can lend itself to this kind of cultural intervention that Nixon proposes and going to the different kind of like formal innovations that I just mentioned and also like um, the ones I mentioned here in this image. I'll pause for a moment to uh, give you a moment to read it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much like nearly all from my end, but i uh, wrap up with this, um, this piece I did on the Deluca effect, which is essentially kind of like a formal kind of experimentation in comics where several moments of time come together and compresses itself into a single image. Um, the time-space dynamics in comics uh, or the sequential and simultaneous nature, as Satanis says, is something that I find especially fascinating because it really opens the medium to a wide range of possibilities, including like in versatile communication and in graphic medicine or like in using it kind of like in image textual explorations of like uh, like tr of trauma and so on and so forth. So um, as I like to say, and I, this, kind of, this, this is the line that I kind of like put in all my applications that the possibilities are endless and entirely ours to explore. So yeah, that's kind of like all from my end. Sorry, I was like so nervous about the process. I'm really not good at this. Yay, well, that was quick, and we're gonna we're gonna get you to slow down a little bit and talk some more about because um, I'm gonna ask you some questions. But also, let me just um, say that if folks want to put questions in the chat, I should have said that earlier. Please do or comments. Um, and Kate, <clears throat> be prepared to pull stuff up because um, I, I we might 
I might want you to show stuff again and talk about individual images. So ask questions, put questions in the talk. Thank you, Kay. Um, now I'm going to I'm going to start us off with some um, not really a response, but more like a get some some conversation going with Kay. OK, um, so one of the things um, that I think is really interesting is that you did. And I, I think this is kind of useful for people dissertating because it seems like actually um, you had to figure something out. So I like to, I, the thing I love about working with Kay is that she figures things out and you get to see it. You get to really watch it. And it's really kind of amazing to see in, in practice. So I want to, I want to get you to talk a little bit about that. Um, so people can understand what you've had to figure out to do this dissertation the way you've done it. But one of the things, right. Um, and you did, you kind of mentioned, and I didn't remember this, that for the MA, they said, no, you can't do comics or you, yeah, you can't draw. Um, but I, I think you took a little bit longer to figure it out for yourself too. Um, and I just <clears throat> wondered if maybe you could talk a little bit about how um, you, you kind of came to the fact that drawing, you sort of presented this a little bit, but then, but drawing kind of became the solution because you were initially gonna use comics, they were gonna be an object, yeah. But then they became, as you say, the method. And so talk a little bit more about that, um, how you came to realize that. I mean, I, I, I literally want to know what happened when you started drawing that kind of allowed you to communicate what you needed to communicate. Right. Yeah. So that's a really interesting question, because I definitely remember this point when I was really struggling with um, comics as a way to just illustrate ideas as opposed to like think with. And I remember being really nervous about my drawings just kind of like repeating what the text is saying as opposed to like doing all this, um, you know, like work by itself. So from studying like comics theory by all these comic scholars and, you know, like reading really cool comics myself, I knew that it was doable. I knew the medium can do more than this, but I, I will not say like I was able to do it right away. It was like a lot of... It was, it was hard, you know, like one has to like try and figure out how to make the image do the talking by itself and have the text as like, you know, like the, I think I point out in one of the images there, like how the, how comics are not compelling because of images alone or words alone. It's because like what they do together. So I definitely had to try and figure that out. And it involved honestly, a lot of reading good comics. And I keep going back to Bechtel because I feel like she does a lot of innovative work in the medium even though like she her comics are always like very self-centric but uh, it's also like it has definitely has sociological data if you look like hard enough so I kept going back to her and I also started looking at older uh, like older American comics by uh, American comics by like crazy cat and that sort of like um, so basically yeah a lot of practice essentially and then I try to kind of like ask myself questions like what do I want to do with this like do I just want to draw comics because I like comics or do I want to draw comics because I think it can do something special so yeah that's what essentially the kind of question I went with and yeah yeah I'm rambling now yeah. so I'm gonna stop yeah yeah um show pull up the image text image again okay for us right so I want to I want to get you to because that's you you saying that's a solution and I want you to talk about that image because it's amazing, right? So comic, comics comics, combine image and text um, and you've visualized it yeah. for us in this I, image and just talk us through the image. I think I'll also pull up the image with the stage, the one with yeah. Bechdel and Mouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do, yeah. do both of those, yeah. Talk us through. So, yeah, this is the one I was, this is the one I drew very recently um, this week, I think. So I was kind of like trying to explain how in comics, like words and images are like not separate, but they come together. And also I was trying to explain like how there are layers in comics. So I figured the only way to do it is like, is to actually show it, which is why I kind of like made this 3D model and kind of like juxtaposed all these Im images on top of it. And these images are actually a part, you know, like images from the chapter I was drawing. So these are the images from the preceding pages. So yeah, I was like, kind of like, yeah, it, it's fun to do and hopefully it gets the point across, but let me pull up the 
Yeah, so let me okay. just hold on because I want to make sure everybody understands that. So that's, in a sense, that's your chapter condensed into this, yeah. these blocks. Yeah, I didn't even realize that. Okay, great. <laughs> so smart. <laughs> going to pull it up. see do i have it um did the screen change or no it's still the same one um okay okay just stop and least yes okay is that the background one yes that's it mm -hmm. yeah so this is the image of how I actually staged it because I figured this is a dissertation and I definitely have to do some amount of literature review. Like I couldn't like get away from it completely. Although I'd say like Professor Dinrick and Professor Santana never really told me to like, you have to do this. But I figured, you know, like some context is, ne is necessary and nice to have. So, but I also did not want to just, you know, like quote books constantly, even in a visual manner. So I figured I really don't, have to keep up with the same expectations of like a textual dissertation and I figured I could do things differently. So what I did here was I um, created a stage to um, talk about Spiegelman and Begda's experience in drawing comics and kind of like stage their experience, stage their experience instead of talking about it. So um, in this one, especially talk about how Spiegelman's um, mouse was put in the NY Times fiction list and he had a kind of like a fight with the editor saying like is Holocaust fiction to you and uh, he eventually got it moved but that was kind of like in the beginning of when graphic narratives was becoming like culturally recognized so yeah that that happened and I also like talk about how um, Begdel does like intertextual connections so that's there and I also talk about how in comics like how, how Susan Square says it's like how you internalize the action and then I have myself here and different versions of myself because like these are like different moments like condensed together so yeah these are kind of like the way just the kind of like different ways I found how to make the medium work for me and not just you know like do illustrative drawings right yeah that's in, that's amazing and also um related to that it's kind of connected um, and it relates to your your display of the books with quotes from them um, is that you know you you had to work out and this is one of the things you had to kind of figure out about the dissertation was um, how to cite and this is so and so I, I think this is also just really interesting in terms of um, everybody doing a dissertation or any kind of research right has to think about the politics of citation and you've kind of had to think about that. And one of the things that you, well, had to figure out was, or come to, was the fact that um, you, you, at first you were going to use copies of, you were just going to use photocopies, right? And then we had to talk about permissions. Yeah. And so yeah. in the end, you're redrawing everything. So yeah. I want people to understand this, right? So explain that a little bit about how you're citing these texts. Right. So at first I was just, you know, like using screenshots or, you know, like if it was a physical book, I was taking photographs with my phone and just pasting it there. First of all, it did not look good. Like it did not go with the rest of the aesthetic of my drawing. So I was not pleased with it. And then came the question of like copyright because fair use allows only a certain number of pictures. And this would definitely have resulted in way too many. It would have gone over. So uh, I asked Nick because he's literally the only person who has completed this before me. So he said, like, read all everything. I read all things all the time and I don't get, ever get into copyright problem. Um, so I started redrawing and it's definitely made it like more coherent with my drawing style. So for example, like the uh, this uh, uh, figure of Begdal's father and Begdal's mother that you see here is a scene from Fun Home, but it's redrawn. Like I've tried to keep it very close to her style, but it's redrawn. Um, so doing redrawings definitely kind of like also helped me understand the like the visual grammar of the comics a little bit more. It's like visual annotation when you kind of like really get into the visual realm of things as opposed to just, you know, like approaching it from a kind of from a like outsider perspective. So um, yeah, that was. Yeah, that's great. And of course, you know, and it's a, a kind of interesting citation of Bechdel who's doing this kind of same redrawing of images herself. So you've got this sort of 
um, citation of a citation of a citation um, that you're creating. And I'm sure Bechtel would love it that you're doing <laughs> that, but I don't, I don't know. Um, okay, <laughs> I, wanna, I, I wanna let other people jump in as well. So please interrupt me. Um, I have some more questions, but I, I want, uh, just give me a wave if, if somebody has a, a question or wants to ask a, something to clarify something that Kay has said. Please just jump in, okay? Um, the other thing I think maybe you could talk a little bit about is, um, I know you said at one point that you were finding it difficult to draw a, a comic version of yourself, an iconic version of yourself. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if you could, and I think you've you've done it, you got it. Um, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that process and why that was difficult for you, how you figured out how to, how to do it, how you came to a solution about that, um, or also just how you feel about that image of yourself. Yeah. yeah. So again, I'll refer to Begda once for a moment, because um, I remember like in a recent interview, she mentioned like she had taken like 2000 pictures of herself or in different um, poses as to serve as references for herself as well as like other characters she was drawing and I take a lot of reference photos as well but I'll say this I have some body image issues and just you know like taking photos of myself and drawing them it was jarring in a way I did not expect and I really couldn't tell why it was like that but it was so I really had to figure out a bit more some somebody like, like that looked like me but also like something that I won't have to kind of like look at my body in detail every time I'm drawing myself so I came up with this kind of like semi-cartoon version I would say like I'm not sure if it looks like me maybe you all can tell me but I think it kind of does but also like it's like like kind of like very general enough that it doesn't bother me to look at it anymore but yeah but I think the closeness the little bit of closeness and also like the distance it has from my actual image helps to kind of like it helps me kind of like in having a little bit of distance because when I'm writing about especially in my chapter on sex and shame in South Asia where I'm talking about like lots of the family drama stuff it's really important for me to have a little bit of distance from it to have any sort of like analytical perspective otherwise you're just too involved and sometimes things hurt too much so uh, yeah a little bit of distance that this character provides me has been really really generative for me. Oh, that's, that's great. That's really, I mean, that's interesting because you had described it as kind of a problem. Like I, I can't do this, but you found a way. Um, the other thing I would say you figured out your style or have you, I mean, would you say that you have, um, and that's changed pretty significantly. And one of the things that um, you've done that's been kind of important is, I mean, you're, it's fairly wordy still, yeah. but it's much less wordy. You've, you've kind of subtracted, you've had yeah. to subtract words. Um, and, you know, it's not like, again, we're, we seem to be citing a lot of Bechdel here, but of course, I mean, there's nobody really as wordy as Bechdel. She's, she's got a lot of words. And of course, words also in your work and in Bechdel's or in comics um, actually have kind of materiality. But talk about that process of kind of how you work with um, words and what you're having to do literally in terms of cutting or subtracting. Right. Um, yeah. 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 So, so I've quickly I think very quickly I figured that I cannot have scripts like it would have been so much easier if I could just have like a very clean script and I could just draw from that but I figured out that was not going to just that was just not going to work so what I right now after I think doing like three or four chapters I'm beginning to figure out what I need to do is like I need to start doodling image textually right I need to do words and pictures like together and then it results in this really illegible piece of paper that nobody but me can read. It has these tiny thumbnails with all the like sketches, completely legible sketches, but with words with it. That from there, I kind of like try to form this, not really script, but more like, I would think it's more like a storyboard. I think I've shown Professor Diedrich a couple of those things. So maybe it's, it's a little bit more like a storyboard than like a script. 
But um, yeah, and I go from there and kind of like this process is really frustrating because it's very time consuming because if you just write and draw from it, it's straightforward. But this is like you're constantly going back and forth between two mediums. But it kind of like has convinced me more about what I've, what I've been arguing like theoretically for a long time that comics, comics are generative. You just don't illustrate a thought. You kind of like think in the medium. So yeah, that kind of like, it's still anecdotal because, you know, like it's just my experience, but yeah, it's, it's a little bit more convincing to me right now. Great. Thank you. Okay. I see some, I'm sorry. I didn't look at the chat. Hey, you need to tell me to look at the chat. Um, there's some stuff in the, in the um, chat. Um, so actually there's one um, from, let's, let me start with this. Um, uh, so somebody from Leah, Leah has sent me um, a, a message, direct message, so you all are not seeing this, but saying that there are some students from English 112, and you're studying race and global literature, and it, it, Leah is asking if you can elaborate a little on issues of representation you may have run into when you're drawing, and how you approach those in your dissertation. That's a great question. Thank you for that. Did you get that, Kay? Um, issues of representation? Yeah, so can you elaborate a little on issues of representation you may have run into when you're drawing and how you approach those in your dissertation, thinking about global literature? Um, yeah, <laughs> I wanna say like, I feel like I'm guilty of it myself because, okay, so I was trained in a very colonial education system and most of the stuff that I've read and I still read are by a lot of white scholars and a lot of white artists and they're fantastic like I, I feel like Begdal is genuinely like amazing I love her work but also what has happened as a result of kind of like this kind of publishing tendency where certain people get published and certain people do not is that um, comics culture in certain countries and comics culture in like communities of color has not developed as much because I know a lot of people who are doing really good comics work in the global south, but they don't get the recognition or the publishing, like the traditional publishing avenues for it. And as a result, we don't read those works. We don't cite those works. We don't talk about those works. So yeah, I, I'm saying I'm a little bit guilty of it myself. It's because like while I try to seek them out, I definitely do not do my proportionate um, share of proportionate share of like citing or kind of like working with those works, which I need to be a bit more, bit more aware of, but it's also really hard when mainstream publishing will not do the kind of like preliminary work for you where they kind of like put this works out in the same way as they do scholars here. So yeah, I think I honestly do not know like how do you kind of like solve that problem as, as like grad instructors, I guess like I guess one way to do it is like just supporting and buying comics by people of color and disabled people as much as we can to like just you know like show publishers that there's a market for it and they should be doing more but beyond that I that's a great question but I do not know like how we can solve this problem of representation. Yeah thank you for that. I'm also seeing from William this kind of relates to my question about subtraction but this is a great um, question comment in the in the chat. I've noticed that some panels have a lot of text. How do you identify the balance between imagery and information between each panel? So that's kind of about your mapping. Do you, do you want to say something more about that? That's a really great. Yeah, um, so I do not really have kind of like a fixed formula for it. If it starts to have too much text where I feel like I am tired of looking at it, then I'll try to, you know, like reduce the text in it. But if I try to, if I figure it out, like at the outset, like not after having done the page, if I figured it out, like at the beginning, then what I do is kind of like try to include more visual imagery. For example, like I think I'll pull up one more image to kind of like show what I mean. Um, okay. Can you see the image? The one about time in comics? Yeah, yeah. So uh, this is a page where I was trying to talk about like how innovations in the medium are almost always related to the spatial arrangement in page. So there's this thing we have in comic studies, which kind of like says um, time in comics is understood by the, by the way of space. Like we kind of like divide or organize time by using spatial arrangements. And I figured for this kind of like, for this kind of like argument to work, I'd have to cite many, many, many people. And if I try to do that textually, it would become overwhelming. So what I did was like, I did a lot of visual citation in this. So of course you have this kind of like primary narrative here in 
form of like these four text boxes. But what you also have is like pictures within pictures. So if I zoom in, like here's Begdel doing how time passes by showing just this one tree in the background. And then um, there's uh, Di Luca, Giovanni Di Luca doing this kind of like different, um, that's the kind of like the origin of the, the De Luca effect where you compress different, you know, like where you use multiple multiple instances of the same character to compress events, uh, you know, like uh, time, different moments of time in one page. And here's Begdel's take on the De Luca effect, which was published in the New Yorker. I mean, it's not super clear in this image, but um, in the full resolution one, it should be kind of like visible. And then I also cite um, Little Nemo, and then I cite Susanna's here and Watchmen. Watchmen, I think, is really interesting if you read it because um, the character Manhattan, who is seen as a superhero, really, but to me, he seems like he's a metaphor for time in comics. And Moore was really having a lot of fun with it because um, the character Manhattan can actually, you know, like he's very, he's present everywhere all at once and he can see everything all at once, which is something that we've got going with the medium because you take it in all at once. So that's the kind of like, uh, that's what I cite here as well. And I also cite a Sontag here about how we are meant to defend art till the end of time, because I feel like that's what I'm something doing all the time with comics. So yeah, that's, and also like here, I cite my cloud, I cite shoot here. I, again, I cite shoot here again. And I also like use uh, instance from, like I do a bit of um, embarrassing self-citing here by putting like an image I drew in the, you know, like again, in one of the previous pages, like here in terms of the, uh, like the, in the photo frames there. So yeah, so I kind of like try to balance it out by doing a mix of visual and textual imagery, I guess. Wow, that's so amazing. Um, and some Dolly I see in there, yeah. but also, yeah. so just quick follow up on that. And then I see Justin Johnston has a question as well in the, in the chat. One moment. How, how do you, how do you draw so in that instance you know kind of thinking about still working oops, what is that that might be uk that was that was siri for my i don't know what that was siri saying how do you draw this um but literally how so just take um the stuff that's on the wall that's sort of now we're looking at it from above um is there uh, just explain to me how you put that together, how you drew that. Oh my God. So this thing, I remember I drew it as a part of like, so uh, remember I was auditing this class by Susanna's, like uh, next class, like early in the spring. And I think it resulted from like one of his prompts about time and comics. And I started drawing, and I had this great idea about how I can do sort of like a bird's eye view kind of thing. And I, I, it was like, it sounded all very cool in my head. But then actually drawing it was really, really painful because figuring out the perspective was really tough because, and for this, you cannot even take that many reference pictures. I remember at one point asking my partner if he has, if we have a ladder that he can climb up on and take a picture of me from on top of me. And he was like, enough of your badness. I am not just, so you just, you can draw it. And, and he was like, you can definitely draw it without references. I was like, I really cannot. But in the end, it did work out. But for the room, what I did was I figured out that I, ha I can do like 3D modeling on Blender. So um, before drawing it, I actually went on Blender and I created a room and then I placed furniture in it. And then I kind of like, I basically did kind of like set the room in visual in virtual space and then played with it a little bit to find out like where I would place what. And then at, use that as a reference to draw the draw this thing it's a time consuming process but it's really really rewarding because you're kind of like you know like trying to figure out everything you can do with the medium and you're constantly pushing its limits so yeah that's yeah. fun to work with that's wonderful yeah figuring it out and constantly pushing its limits all right uh justin do you want to come on and ask your question and then i see adrian's got one too so um are you there, Justin? I, I realize I should let other people talk, or well, that's a thought. Is Justin still here? Maybe he's not. There he is. Yeah. Hi. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I've, uh, Put you on the spot. Yeah. No. No. no that's fine. I, I. I. was enjoying this. I, I. I missed a bit of it. So I hope this isn't a redundant question that you didn't already address this. But I've been thinking about this question of style a little bit, um, uh, and looking at all the so sort of there is a sort of coherence to the way that you. 
um, you know, illust your illustrations. And so I was wondering if you thought about that, like, you know, meditated on your own style and, and uh, how would you characterize it, you know, uh, your own style. And then other, I'm also curious about, um, you know, in the course of a dissertation or writing a large project like this, you know, uh, in different moments is the, uh, the argument takes different shapes or the exploration takes different shapes. Do you, do you, do you ever change your style? Do, I mean, do you, I'm thinking especially about the color palette in particular, you know, I've noticed some consistency in that. So I just wonder if you'd reflect on that a little bit, it would be, uh, I'd be curious to hear it. Yeah. 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 That's a great question because I definitely think I found my style last year. And for the first couple of years, I was just fumbling about trying to find it and not finding it and getting super frustrated about it to the extent where I definitely want to go back. And I have already revised one of the first chapter I've written. I've already revised it in the current style. And I definitely also want to revise my second chapter because I cannot stand the thought of submitting something in my former style, which does not excite me or bring me joy anymore. So, um, yeah, it was definitely kind of like a learning curve. And I did not. I. I, I think I'm kind of, I, th I feel like there's definitely lots of room for improvement, but I kind of am happy with my current style. It, it's kind of like enough cartoony, but also, you know, like not too far removed from reality as opposed to my older style, which I'm not going to show anybody, <laughs> which, was, um, which was, I don't know, it didn't look very good. And yeah, it, yeah, it was, I, it was definitely like, it's what I kind of like was emphasizing about, um, how comics is something like how you know like comics to me is something you know like where you learn something every day and you just draw and you draw and you draw until you figure out like what you're happy with so that's kind of like what I figured out during this kind of like long project that I definitely like just drawing comics taught me a lot about like comics theory so yeah great thank you okay Adrian you've got a, a question um yeah, uh, I think you've already talked about this, about the interplay between image and text, but I kept thinking about it, uh, and I, I would like to hear you more about it. So uh, let me ask the question in a different way, maybe. I noticed that one of the panels that you have, for example, the, the one of the floods, uh, really the image is some kind of evidence of what the text is saying. It kind of makes it palpable and real. I like said, this actually happens. But in this one, like the panel that you were just showing, I think what you're dramatizing is your own thinking process of saying uh, how you're, you're wrestling with all these different pieces of information. And then the text becomes a kind of a reflection uh, trigger or something like that. And also for the, for the reader. So I was thinking about this quote of, uh, you know, famous Scott McLeod of yeah. saying, you know, comic is basically, uh, the amplification of emotions or a, or a message by simplifying uh, the the vehicle or the or the communication thing, and I was thinking that I think you're wrestling with that, that you're actually trying to undo McLeod and say actually I don't have to oversimplify, uh, and I wanted to hear you about that to see if you are if you're actually uh, confronting that and trying to say yes maybe. Uh, maybe it's, it's not necessary to oversimplify and we can produce uh, yeah. a different kind of comic. But that was my, yeah. Uh, I just wanted yeah. to hear you thinking about that. Yeah, I feel like McLeod is definitely very generative for my work. It was, I think the first piece of comics theory that I actually read um, and I still respect his work very, very much, but I'm not sure like how much I agree with the fact that he has, he has this concept where he says like, um, if the narrator has like a face of like a, like a very realistic face of a human being, then you really do not identify with the character. And if it has like a cartoon, cartoon kind of face, then you identify with it. I don't think that's true. I, yeah, I don't think that's because I definitely don't have to look like Bechdel or like Spiegelman to identify with parts of their life. And I don't think it works that way. I think simplification definitely makes it a very effective communication tool. So if you're working in, you know, like Psycom or if you're working in like data journalism, like graphic data journalism, then simplification is absolutely the way to go. But for kind of like long form or ethnographic comics, like the kind of things I'm doing, I, yeah, I, I simplification really, yeah, I haven't done it. And I don't think it would, I don't think it would make my work less interesting but I don't think it would serve it in any way if that makes sense 
or at least that's what I like personally feel. And um, yeah, but yeah, still my, like, the rest of McLeod's um, understanding comics it has been like definitely very um, generative in my work. And I refer to in the picture I was like, you know, like just sharing before I stopped sharing, I refer to his um, concept of like how time works in comics as well. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. And Adrian has a question about, do you have a target number of graphic panels for your dissertation? This is a great question. Woo, <laughs> we're on the spot. Thank you. Oh my God. Um, okay. So I want to not exceed 150 pages because I believe that a finished dissertation is better than <laughs> a not finished dissertation. So um, I know 150 pages sounds like actually like um, pretty low for dissertations, but I feel like since I'm doing images and words, maybe I can get away with it. So I don't have a number of panels, but I have a number of pages. Great. Does that answer your question, Adrian? <laughs> she wanted the panels. <laughs> Okay, I've got one more and then maybe I, I wanted to ask you about the about the climate change because we haven't really talked about that. We've been more general and I wanted to kind of um, ask you about visualizing, visualizing climate change a little bit. Um, I mean, and I, I, I like the also the quote from Sarawick about shifting about graphic medicine as a shift from clinic to community. So kind of thinking about the importance of racial and disability justice to climate justice, and also that this is a kind of concern for graphic medicine, right? Um, one of the things that I'm wondering about is this kind of question of scale and moving between scales. And you kind of showed us some examples of how you're, you're kind of connecting the kind of scale of the kind of question of the straw ban versus plastics more generally. Um, but tell us a little bit about and maybe pull up some of these data visualizations. How is it that, what is it that comics really does for us that allows us to kind of see those, those uh, different scales? Because that seems important in terms of climate, uh, understanding what's going on in terms of climate. You did cover this a little bit in your presentation, but I, um, I want to kind of get at this how how comics moves allows this kind of um, different scales on the same page. Um, so that's the sequential and si simultaneous qualities of comics as well. So okay. yeah, yeah. So recently I came across this quote. I do not remember who it was by, but it was this really fantastic quote about how when a number becomes too big it does not have any meaning anymore and how we have to visualize it or kind of like even like explain it in other words what it actually means. So I feel like um, that's where comics come in as far as graphic data visualization is concerned because it can make like, it can take really big numbers that we think we understand, but we don't really, that not the extent of it and kind of like put it into like understandable snippets. So um, for example, like in this, um, I'll pull up another picture. So in this image here, I talk about um, how um, countries like countries in the global south, like Bangladesh, like Pakistan, like India, they're often like um, blamed for increasing global greenhouse gas emissions. But if you look at the if you look at the per capita emissions, it's actually much lower than the per capita emissions we have here in the United States or in like other first world countries like Australia, Canada, Finland. Um, there was this, I could be, I could be, I could be a little wrong because I do not exactly remember it, but I use this stat in my, in one of my earlier chapters that um, it takes a family of 14 in India to equate the carbon footprint of a family of four in the United States. But so like, it's really like, there's a huge discrepancy, but that's the narrative is still like the countries in the, the, the dirty countries in the global South are contributing to climate change. So um, in this here, I kind of like try to visualize that. So kind of like you get that impact right away. I, I'm not sure if it works, but yeah, that's what I'm kind of like trying to get at the data visualization. Um, um, to give you another example, I, let me see.
I'll pull up the example that I used in um, Statue of with the Statue of Liberty one. This is actually a good place for me to ask a question. So I tried, I did this like very recently, um, like yesterday or day before yesterday. And I pull that, I put the figure of Statue of Liberty there, kind of like to show like how drastic the water level reduction is in Lake Mead, because I was reading lots of accounts of like um, individual citizens who are like boat enthusiasts who are, you know, like who have been to certain places in the lake, in the Lake Mead for fishing last year, they can't find water there this year. So that's how, kind of like drastic the change in water levels are and I had to find a way to like represent that but when I was doing um just this data visualization like in a you know like in a very straight without creative rendering manner I was like is that clear or do I need to emphasize it in some way so I figured Statue of Liberty is very tall everybody knows how tall it is and if I try to put that there maybe people can get exactly how serious this is so I'm not sure if it works maybe you can tell me so um yeah what do people think? Does it work? I mean, this is the question of data visualization, right? How do we make this, how do we make us be able to see what this means? What do anybody want to give thoughts? People are shy. <laughs> oh, I think, I think it works. I, uh, I keep thinking, however, how this is very immediate but you want to weave into your argument the slow violence concept of Rob Nixon. And I was thinking that that's more difficult to, uh, to draw. Maybe you have found a way. And I would like to see if you have that other approach. Like this is almost like immediate, you get it, boom. It's a, it's a flash uh, that, uh, that gets into you and you cannot forget it. But, uh, but how about the, the, other, the other way? How do you represent the slow violence? Yeah. Uh, concept that is uh, that is in itself more intractable, I think, um, especially the way Nipson explores it, saying, you know, this is actually the Anthropocene developing uh, through 200 yeah. years, and we are just uh, so. That's actually a great question. I do a little bit. I don't. I do not do a lot of it, but I did try to explain a little bit of it in this feature. Um, let me see. So this is my page on the slow violence. And I tried to kind of like explain his theory with an example from um, Cancer Alley. So Cancer Alley is kind of like this 85 mile stretch alongside Mississippi River. And it comprises of some 150 or more petrochem petrochemical plants. And the place there has been dubbed Cancer Alley because like um, rates of cancer there are very high in the area compared to the city in countrywide median. And it is because of how many factories there are. So um, they, this is a very, I think this is a kind of like a text heavy page, but what I'm trying to do here with this kind of like this bottom panel right here is kind of like trying to show all these, like how dense the factories are. And yeah, and just kind of like, and then also like I talk about um, e-waste in Ghana. So there has been, as far as I know, like there has been this kind of, um, so what United States and all the first world nations were doing up till like a couple of years back, before there was some sort of international law put in place was they were dumping their e-waste and their other toxic waste in um, third world countries. And um, it led to it led to people in those countries, people who live there in those areas, like have a lot of like health complications. And that has kind of stopped right now as, as far as I know, but not still entirely. So um, here I draw a map of the, the, the town in Ghana where um, this kind of like e-waste was kind of like illegally dumped by the waste, uh, by, by the West. So um, yeah, that's, I try to do it, but it's, it's, it's hard. Like you said, it's really hard because it's a slow violence is also like a very complex issue. And so while the temporal nature of comics is like ideal for explaining it, I'm, I think I'm definitely still working out like how to best make use of it. Well, thank you. I think it's great. It's, yes. Uh, you know, like in the other one, the image takes preeminence and this one, the text takes preeminence. And it's great. I mean, maybe that's how it has to be, but thank you. 
I just pointing out that Jeanette Darcy, I think this is a really great comment about your the earlier image that I think it works as data visualization plus added weight of symbolism of the various meanings associated with the statue yeah. itself. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really great comment. Um, I, maybe if anybody else, does anybody have last questions or comments? Um, for Kay, I mean, I was just going to throw out one last thing, which was about how you feel <laughs> having done the climate change chapter. Um, well, you're not finished, you're still working on it, but. I have one page left. Does it, did it, does it feel, what, what's your feeling? <laughs> what's your Sorry. feeling? Of, yeah, okay, yeah. I was gonna say, did, did you work through something? Or is it, what, what did, how did you come out of that, doing, yeah. drawing that? So I feel like I've never looked at this many articles, like, you know, like starting from scientific journals to uh, lots of news coverage, in including the coverage from like local papers that people tend to not look at that often. Um, it was a lot of, there was a lot of research involved before I started drawing. And even when I started drawing, I had to keep going back to the, like the material. And honestly, I feel a little depressed because we're not doing enough. But also, like, I'm not sure how as individuals we can do enough because we need political intervention. And yeah, I have no idea how do we enact political interve intervention as individuals. Everybody, I believe that activism and, you know, like grassroots organizations really help, but all of us cannot be activists or like grassroots organization organizers. So like, what do we do in that case? Because I have this panel about, you know, like individual efforts, like, you know, like using a reusable grocery bag or you know, um, not you doing fast fashion, which is all like, it's fine, but it really does not do much in the larger scheme of things. And that's really depressing to learn. Okay, thanks for that. Okay, we're now we're all depressed, but I will point to some other comments in and questions in the chat. Um, so Adrian said the Lake Mead graphic works because you see the, lo the loss of water side beside with a recognizable image to quantify the volume of water that's gone. Yeah, that's really well put. And then William is asking, assuming you continue on with creating scholarly comics, what role do you want the audience to take? That's a really interesting question. Thank you for asking. I feel like the, I feel like, the role I want the audience to take is like what Janet does, just did in that comment there, because I really was not thinking about the symbolism of the statue itself. But now that she has mentioned it, I feel like that's such a great interpretation. So um, yeah, I think like affordances, is, affordances and interpretations is a great way to go. Cool, great, great question and great answer. Um, and Young Bin Lee is asking, is, are there any difficulties when drawing comics that are very closely related to issues? So what are some difficulties related to kind of issues that are happening now? You're sad a lot of the time when you're drawing. Ice cream helps, but no, it's really, but to be um, absolutely serious, it's really, really sad. I think I, when I, I drew a chapter about the pandemic that definitely made me cry at some times, especially because there was like, I, there was like a lot of death in my family, especially with the second wave in India. Um, but yeah, and this climate chapter has definitely been really hard to draw, but I feel more enriched as a result of it. So I guess net positive, but I don't know. Okay. We we might, th that net positive, um, yeah. If anybody, does anybody have any last thoughts or I just, I wanna say, wow, thank you, Kay. Um, what a wonderful presentation and wow, this is such great work. Um, so thank you for that. Adrian, do you wanna? I just wanna say that it was wonderful that I think all of us want to see more of it and that's a tribute to the quality of the work and, uh, and give us more, it's, it's great. Thank you, Kay. Thank you for listening and also for putting up with me when I'm nervous because I speak really fast when I'm nervous and that cannot be fun for people who are listening, but thank you. We got it. We got it all. Um, and here, look at the chat here. Part of why the Mead graphic works for me is that it points to a symbol of democracy emerging out of climate catastrophe. In other words, it is both shocking, informative, and also perhaps somewhat optimistic. Thank you. That's a really great comment. That's nice. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for all, everybody for being here and for participating in the in the conversation. I yeah. appreciate it.
Well, thank you both of you. Thank you, Kay, and thank you, Lisa. You did a really wonderful job.